This episode contains graphic content that may be disturbing or traumatizing to some audiences. Listener discretion is advised. On November 3, 2021, deputies from the Greenville County, South Carolina Sheriff's Office issued an arrest warrant for Zachary David Hughes in connection with a horrific rose petal murder. Hughes was charged with murder and use of a weapon in the commission of a violent crime during the savage October 13, 2021 slaying of 41-year-old Christina Parcell in Greer, South Carolina. Parcell's body was found by her fiancé, Bradley Post, at the home of her sister, Tina Parcell. The veterinary technician had been stabbed 31 times in the face and neck area, and in a shocking ritualistic display, her killer allegedly sprinkled rose petals around her body after dragging and posing her in the front living room of this 2,100-square-foot suburban home. The shocking crime shook South Carolina. People wanted justice, and they wanted to know Parcell's killer was off the streets. When Bradley Post was arrested just six days after the murder on unrelated charges tied to a child pornography and exploitation investigation, many believed the investigation would soon reveal him as the murder suspect. But the community was shocked when the arrest of Hughes was announced instead. Like we said on last week's episode, this was a bolt from the blue. By all accounts, Zachary David Hughes, a California native and graduate of the prestigious Juilliard School in New York City, was an unlikely suspect. An impossible suspect, even. A classically trained concert pianist, Hughes studied and performed concertos written by famed composer Ludwig von Beethoven. He was preparing to begin his new job as a pianist on an international cruise line and was in Detroit, Michigan, awaiting a flight to Europe the following day when he learned warrants had been issued for his arrest. According to a motion filed by his defense team, when Hughes found out he was wanted in connection with Parcell's murder, he didn't try and board his flight, skip across the border into Canada, or attempt to flee into middle America. There was no manhunt. No chase, no stakeout, no drama. Instead, Hughes rented a car, drove nearly 700 miles from Detroit to Greenville, and promptly turned himself in to authorities. With no apparent connections to Christina Parcell, Hughes' motive was a complete mystery. But as we noted last week, the evidence against him was seemingly damning. During an April 2022 bond hearing, Before Circuit Court Judge Edward W. Miller, South Carolina 13th Circuit Solicitor Walt Wilkins detailed some of this evidence. Here again is Solicitor Wilkins. The the facts that that show the, uh, so Zach Hughes tied to this case and the basis of the arrest warrant um, show that about 10 o'clock that morning, a ring camera from across the street shows the defendant dressed in a black hoodie in a backpack entering the front door. Uh, the defendant is seen on camera from another ring camera leaving the subdivision on a bicycle. The investigation moved to flock cameras, which are cameras that are located around Greenville County, and these cameras located Zach Hughes' truck with a bicycle in the back of the truck matching the exact bicycle leaving the neighborhood at the time of the murder. The bicycle was located at a residence where the defendant was living with another family here in Greenville, in the city of Greenville. A resident of that house stated that it was his bicycle and it had recently been moved while it had not been used for a long time. Hughes' attorney, Mark Moyer, disputed that video evidence, though, claiming the clips are a case of mistaken identity. The videos, as I watched, don't show don't show Zach. However, prosecutors have further asserted that DNA collected from under Parcell's fingernails belonged to Hughes, which would definitively link him to the crime scene. And then finally, Your Honor, the victim's fingernails were processed for DNA. And the DNA conclusively shows that Zach Hughes' DNA was under the fingernails of the victim. The premeditation and calculation and planning that had to go into this crime um, was, um, was, was pretty impeccable. Who is Zachary David Hughes? 
How was he connected to Christina Parcell? And what could have possibly motivated this talented young man with no known ties to the victim to murder her in such a brutal and ritualistic manner? Those are the questions we hope to start answering in this, our second Fitz Files episode dedicated to the mysteriously macabre Rose Petal murder. Welcome back to Fitz Files, a true crime podcast hosted and produced by the news team at FitzNews.com. We're the crew that broke the Murdoch murders crime and corruption saga and America's cheer incorporated sex abuse scandal wide open. Fitz News is an independent, tenacious media outlet covering the intersection of crime, justice, politics, and corruption in South Carolina and beyond. I'm your host, Fitz founding editor, Will Folks. I'll be joined on this show by Dylan Nolan, Jen Wood, who you just heard from, and the rest of our news team as we dive deeper into the stories we cover on FitzNews.com. Our goal is to go beyond the headlines, uncovering facts, deciphering their meaning, and holding everyone involved accountable, including ourselves. We'll follow these stories no matter where they take us, and no matter who we manage to piss off, because on this podcast, it's not about agendas, and it's not about egos. It's about seeking the truth and finding true justice. At Fitz Files, we're fierce advocates for justice and justice reform, with a proven track record of calling out dirty cops, crooked judges, and the corrupt politicians who prop them up. The horrific rose petal murder you're hearing about now is the first of many true crime stories we'll be covering this season. And our articles on FitzNews.com play a vital role in supporting these episodes. So in addition to subscribing and reviewing this podcast, positively, I hope, I'd make a request. If you believe in the value of independent news organizations like this one, please support Fitz News by going to FitzNews.com and subscribing today. All the articles, documents, and sound clips you hear on this episode are available for your review on FitzNews.com. Again, that's F-I-T-S-N-E-W-S.com. Thanks for tuning in and supporting us. Now, back to Jen and the story of Zach Hughes, the accused killer in the Rose Petal murder. 30-year-old Zachary David Hughes was born in Morro Bay, California to Dave and Mindy Hughes. Dave and Mindy, who have been married for over 46 years, have another son named Eli, who is 23 years old. According to court documents, Dave and Mindy both were born and raised in California. During his bond hearing on the murder charge in April 2022, Hughes' attorney, Mark Moyer, told the court about the family's cross-country move to Virginia two decades ago. His parents moved the family to Virginia, southeastern Virginia, where the family lived on a farm for a number of years when Zach was 11. Uh, this is where Zach learned about his hard work and discipline. He was homeschooled uh, through the joint effort and sacrifice of both of his parents. After moving young Zach and Eli to Virginia, the Hughes parents made a major decision which appears to have had a profound impact on their eldest son. In 2005, David and Mindy adopted five children, all siblings, all from Russia, in the hopes of providing these children with a better life. According to Hughes' attorneys, the addition of these children to the family had a profound impact on Zach, and not for the better. Um, a significant feature of his upbringing was that his parents adopted five siblings from Russia when Zach was young, and a lot of the burden of raising and taking care of these troubled youth fell on Zach. Unbeknown to any of the Hughes at the time, several of these children suffered from significant emotional, psychological, and or physical damage due to the maltreatment they allegedly received in Russia. Given this damage, the children had difficulty adapting to life in America in general, and specifically to family life in the Hughes' household. The troubled transition placed tremendous stress on each member of the Hughes family, but especially on Zach. Unlike so many young children in this situation though, Zach had an outlet, a release, a sanctuary, a safe place where he was able to discover and develop a gift which would come to define his entire life, or at least define it prior to that murderous morning of October 13th, 2021. 
When Zachary was five or six years old, his parents purchased a used piano at a yard sale. His attorney spoke of that moment during the 2022 bond hearing. Uh, as I stated, and as I think is, is clear from the record, um, Zach, began, Zach is a, an amazing pianist. He began playing when he was about five years old when his, his father uh, brought home a, a, a piano from a, a yard sale. Um, it became clear he was, he was gifted and he began taking lessons with, with some very uh, prominent uh, musical teachers. It soon became obvious Zach had an aptitude for music, but when his adopted siblings joined the family, music became his all-consuming passion, with Zach completely losing himself in the piano. His parents told the court he devoted his entire life to it, using it as an escape from the stress of a suddenly upside-down home life. With the support of Dave and Mindy, Hughes began entering piano competitions, and when he was still in high school, he won first place in a prestigious regional competition. This prize earned him a soloist performance with the California Philharmonic Orchestra, where Hughes delivered a command performance of Beethoven's Emperor Concerto. Hughes's talent was undeniable. In 2010, he applied to the Juilliard School for piano performance. Juilliard is a highly competitive performing arts conservatory in New York City. Entrance into its prestigious program is coveted and incredibly selective. Despite his humble upbringing, Hughes' talent was immediately noticed by the school. Not only was he admitted, he was offered numerous scholarships in the hopes of encouraging him to attend. And attend he did. Well at Juilliard, Hughes thrived both academically and socially. Letters sent from his former classmates for his bond hearing recalled a loyal friend with a great sense of humor and deep love of music. One former classmate named Rachel wrote, If I were to describe Zach in a few words, it would be loyal friend, strong sense of what is morally right and wrong, a big heart for defending those he is close to from harm, and a very patient listener. Rachel described how Hughes would often use his talent to brighten the lives of those in need by playing at hospitals and nursing homes. Another classmate named Jules wrote, What struck me the most when we first met was not only his deep kindness and great ability to laugh and make laugh, but also his profound and rare interest for the core of musical grammar as well as for new music. During his time at Juilliard, Hughes was one of only 12 students around the world and the only one from the United States chosen to play in the Kyoto International Musical Festival. Indeed, by all accounts, Hughes was thriving. It wasn't just music that drove Hughes, though. In 2018, while attending graduate school at the University of Tennessee in pursuit of a master's degree in piano performance, he volunteered to serve in the Marine Corps. His attorney detailed that experience in his bond hearing. In 2018, Zach decided to uh, undertake um, going into the military. He approached a recruiter to join the Marines. The recruiter um, saw that he was, there was something different and also looked into his background and he encouraged Zach to go into and apply for Officer Candidate School. Zach did so, he was the only person from the Tennessee um, jurisdiction that um, admitted someone into the Officer Candidate School. He went to Quantico, Virginia. He was in the midst of training when he ended up with stress fractures in both of his legs and he had to come back to Greenville to, uh, to heal. And he was encouraged to come back. In fact, he was told he was in the top 3% of his class while he was there. It was then that he had some other musical opportunities arise that led him to not pursue and continue with the military career. As Jen noted, it was a piano purchased at a yard sale in southeastern Virginia that enabled young Zachary David Hughes to discover himself, to escape from the stresses and strains of his tumultuous childhood and find a purpose for his life. Well, it was another piano that led Hughes to Greenville, South Carolina, instead of going back to the Marine Corps. The Greenville Unitarian Universalist Fellowship is a church located on State Park Road, approximately three and a half miles north of Greenville's booming downtown. Right around the time Hughes was deciding what to do with his life, this church came in possession 
of what has been described as the Rolls Royce of pianos, a Bosendorfer Imperial Concert Grand. Stretching 9 feet 6 inches and weighing approximately 1,217 pounds, the Imperial Grand is an absolute beast. It contains 97 keys, nine more than most concert pianos, and most models list for anywhere between $250,000 and $350,000. This particular piano was built in 1988 in Vienna, where Beethoven, Hughes' idol, premiered his most famous symphonies at the city's famed Theater an Kantnator. Housed for years in a Chicago concert hall, the piano was gifted to this congregation by the late Rem Stokes, a Clemson graduate who was raised and schooled in Greenville during the latter years of the Great Depression. Stokes passed away in 2022 at the age of 91, but before he died, the church hosted a concert to dedicate this incredible gift it had received from him. The piano Stokes gave the church has been described by reviewers as, quote, a temperamental star sounding harsh and jarring in the hands of pianists who do not understand how to play it, and marvelously refined in the hands of those who do. Marvelously refined hands. Those were exactly what the Unitarian Fellowship was looking for in 2019 ahead of the piano's dedication concert, and they found them on Zach Hughes. Here again is Hughes' friend, Greenville attorney, Marshall Wynn. My wife, Jeanette, and I met Zach when we were searching for a fine pianist to give an inaugural concert on one of the finest pianos made in the world that was given to our congregation by a generous and nearly anonymous donor, who also is a fine amateur pianist. That's how we met Zach. We got to know him. I used to be a fairly decent young pianist myself, never in that category. But I know enough about music to know who is good and what is good. And I believe I know enough about human beings to know who is good and what is good in a human being. To make a long story short, we came to know Zach well, particularly when he practiced at our house. Later on, after that inaugural concert, and many of the people who were here were attending that concert, Zach told us about his dream of performing all 32 of Beethoven's piano sonatas. That is something that is rare, even for well-known professional musicians, recording artists. Very few have done all 32. That is a very difficult undertaking. And he said he wanted to do them all in the 200th year of Beethoven's birth. COVID cut that short as Mr. Moyer has already mentioned, but that did not stop Zach. He finished those and made them publicly available through the Civil Music Museum. Dr. Strange cannot be here from the museum, unfortunately, but Mrs. Strange, who also runs that museum, is here in Zach's support. Not only that, Zach bought a used but good electronic piano and played on the streets of Greenville for the public. He later used that piano in our front yard for a series of lawn concerts open to everybody. And many of the people who were here attended some of those concerts. He did that because he thought it was important. He wanted to give that back to the community. Zach lived with us for over two years. We talked with him every day. He practiced on our piano every day for hours. That's what professional pianists do. He taught students at our house. We met those students. We met their families. He also taught to make a little money. He was recruited to teach online over the internet at the Bronx Conservatory, which is a famous institution that specializes in providing musical teaching to underprivileged children from the Bronx. He did this. We observed this, Your Honor. This is the character of the man that we're talking about here today. Clearly, none of this adds up. We have a phenomenally gifted musician, one generally regarded to be a good person, who volunteered to serve his country, who was seemingly on the cusp 
of greatness. He was welcomed with open arms into the Greenville community, a place people are flocking in droves to live and work. It makes no sense. How did it happen? How in the world did this kind, dutiful, prodigiously gifted young man, whom friends described as loyal with a big heart, how did he end up as the primary suspect in such a savage, seemingly senseless slaying? And not just that, the slaying of a woman with whom he had zero known connections. What could have possibly led Zach Hughes to stab Christina Parcell nearly three dozen times in the head and neck and then ritualistically pose her body around rose petals? Investigators believe the mystery of Zach Hughes' involvement in this crime could be answered through an exploration of his relationship with John Mello the father of Christina Parcell's young daughter. Christina and Mello had been embroiled in a contentious court battle for years over the custody of the young daughter they shared, which we'll be diving into in detail in later episodes. Mello, a self-described music producer, lived on the West Coast prior to moving to Greenville with his family two decades ago. It's not clear how he met Christina Parcell, But the custody battle for their young daughter began in earnest in 2016 and is continuing even after Parcell's death. According to investigators, Zachary Hughes worked for Mello, cleaning his house and performing other odd tasks, beginning in 2020 and continuing through the date of the murder. It is unknown how they met, but they both share a love of music. On October 5th, 2020, Mello took his young daughter with him to Italy in the midst of his ongoing custody battle with Christina, violating a court order. This led to criminal charges being filed against him for custodial interference in Greenville County. On October 21st, 2021, a year later and just a week after Christina's death, Mello returned to Greenville from Italy and was served a warrant for these charges and arrested. Upon being arrest in, arrested in the Greenville County Detention Center, Mellows listed Zachary Hughes on the relationship portion of his intake form, allowing the two of them to communicate while he was incarcerated. Mello also made an iPhone video with Hughes, giving him permission to retrieve his luggage and medication from the Charlotte airport following his arrest. How did authorities link Mello and Hughes? You'll remember, we discussed the ring camera footage obtained from neighbors in the Keene Break subdivision where Christina Parcell was murdered, and how it showed a man in a gray hoodie with a backpack entering the residence at around 10 o'clock a.m. You'll also remember the same individual is seen leaving the residence on a bike, wearing an N95 mask with a hoodie over his head. When authorities learned of the relationship between Mello and Hughes, they began looking at footage from flock cameras. Flock cameras are license plate reading cameras that store data in a searchable database with time and date information in a photo of the car. Flock cameras are located throughout Greenville County. What investigators discovered was chilling. On the day before the murder and the day of the murder, Flock footage showed Zachary Hughes' truck with a bicycle loaded in its bed. This bicycle matched the description of the bicycle seen leaving Christina Parcell's neighborhood at the time of her murder. Law enforcement officials used this footage to obtain a search warrant on the home in which Zachary Hughes was living. During the search, a bicycle was discovered matching the one seen in the back of Zachary Hughes' truck and caught on camera in the neighborhood after Parcell's murder. A witness in Zachary Hughes' home stated he owned the recovered bicycle and had recently used it. During the search, authorities also located Hughes' iPhone and obtained a separate search warrant for it. The phone required a six-digit passcode and law enforcement technicians were unable to lock the device, although they were successful in extracting partial contents from it. According to prosecutors, Mello and Hughes communicated with each other through WhatsApp, an app which encrypts messages and is often used to send texts, videos, and place phone calls securely and surreptitiously. 
WhatsApp is also commonly used when one person in the conversation is residing outside the United States. And at the time of Christina Parcell's homicide, John Mello was in Italy. Some of the WhatsApp messages between Hughes and Mello have been able to be downloaded, but many others have not. The messages investigators have been able to obtain were presented to a South Carolina judge in June of 2022 in a motion compelling Hughes to provide authorities with the passcode to his phone. The messages were concerning. In one conversation on April 17, 2021, Mello told Hughes that he had obtained Christina Parcell's private number and instructed him to, quote, harass the shit out of her. In addition, authorities found numerous conversations between Mello and Hughes on October 13, 2021, the day of Christina Parcell's murder. Specifically, in one conversation, Mello asked Hughes, quote, how did the music research go? Hughes responded, good, I'll tell you over the phone. That was the day of Christina Parcell's murder. A partial extraction from Hughes' iPhone shows it was placed in airplane mode five times, twice on the day before the murders, twice on the day of the murders, and once a week later. Without the passcode, though, investigators cannot access any of the encrypted messages or the geolocation data for the phone. Completely unlocking the device could take nearly four years, leaving officials waiting well past Hughes' trial date to obtain valuable data. On September 20, 2022, South Carolina Circuit Court Judge Letitia Verdon ruled in favor of prosecutors and ordered Hughes to turn over the passcode to his iPhone. Hughes refused, putting him in violation of the court's order. And owing to this refusal, on April 6, 2023, prosecutors filed a motion seeking criminal contempt charges and sanctions against Hughes, in addition to the murder and weapons charges he was already facing. Specifically, prosecutors requested an active incarcerative sentence, arguing that Hughes not only failed to provide the right passcode, but sent prosecutors on a wild goose chase regarding a fake passcode. The April 2023 motion indicated that investigators were finally able to unlock the device, but that there were still hundreds of WhatsApp messages between Hughes and Mello that they couldn't access. As this episode airs, on July 26, 2023, Hughes' iPhone is in the hands of a digital forensic expert who is attempting to retrieve those encrypted messages. That search may come up empty, though, because police and prosecutors think many of the relevant messages that they're seeking were deleted from the app. If there is so much evidence supporting the solicitor's case against Hughes, why is this phone data so important? Again, everything ties back to John Mello. Did the bitter custody battle between him and Christina Parcell get so ugly that Mello had Hughes kill the mother of his young child? And if so, what could have possibly compelled the talented young musician to commit such a brutal crime on the behalf of someone else, someone for whom he only worked upon occasion? Could the arrest of Christina's fiancé, Bradley Post, in connection with the child pornography and exploitation investigation involving Mello's daughter have provided motive? Could multiple unfounded complaints have sent a worried father over the edge? As we mentioned in our previous episode, Post was arrested just one week after Christina's murder and is currently facing six counts of sexual exploitation of a minor, five of them in the first degree one count of third-degree criminal sexual content with a minor, and one count of buggery, which is a whole new layer to the story that I promise we will get into soon. Post is currently incarcerated in the same detention facility as the killer of his fiance. Our previous episode also noted how Post and the estate of Christina Parcell are listed as defendants in two civil lawsuits, one brought on behalf of Parcell's own daughter, and the other brought on behalf of another minor female allegedly victimized by the couple. These lawsuits implicated Christina in the alleged abuse and exploitation of both young girls, and both lawsuits were filed based on materials obtained at the murder scene. 
Could the acrimonious custody battle between John Mello and Christina Parcell and the related child porn and exploitation allegations be the real root of this crime? Could the motive behind the violent stabbing lie in years of family court litigation and Mello's unsuccessful attempts to expose the abuse his daughter was enduring? That certainly would explain a lot, but it wouldn't explain Zach Hughes' involvement in the slain, would it? On the next Rose Petal episode of Fitz Files, we will dig deeper into the into John Mello and the caustic custody case that may have served as the motive for Parcell's murder. Fitz News continues to work tirelessly to try and unravel this incredibly complex story ahead of Zach Hughes' upcoming murder trial, tentatively scheduled for early 2024 in Greenville, South Carolina. We hope you'll continue to count on our news team to keep digging into all aspects of this saga, weaving in everything we know about its key players, their actions, motivations, the investigations, and the consequences. Our goal is to continue telling this story both as it has happened already and as it unfolds ahead of us. We're glad you've joined us on this journey and hope you'll be back next week for more. Don't forget though, please subscribe and leave a review for Fitz Files, your new home for true crime, wherever you download podcasts. Also, please subscribe to FitzNews.com, the media outlet that's bringing you this coverage and where you can access all the articles, files, and clips from this episode. That's F-I-T-S-N-E-W-S dot com.